Good morning, and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Maria Elena Placencia with Fortune International. I am the sales director here at 1030, which is a beautiful boutique urban living project in the heart of South Beach. In this webinar today, we are going to discuss financing in today's market, which is a growing concern for many of us. We will also be covering a special financing option available to qualified 1030 domestic buyers. In today's presentation, we are joined by 1030 developer and CEO of Shum Group, Mr. Masood Shojai. And also joining us today is Mr. Adam Rosenblatt from Academy Mortgage, our preferred lender. We plan to allow for questions and answers at the end, so let's get started. Masood, thank you for joining us today. Can you start this off by telling us a little bit more about yourself and Shoma Group? Uh, good morning uh, to everyone. <clears throat> As uh, I'm pretty sure everybody knows the kind of a background of uh, me and my career. I started 1985 uh, real estate business and uh, uh, we started with one project at that time. And uh, thank God we, uh, we were able to continue. And, uh, mm, uh, and we built uh, more than 10,000 units so far and over a million square feet of uh, uh, retail. And we have delivered uh, uh, four office buildings. Uh, so we started at the residential uh, level and then we expanded to commercial retail uh, and at uh, some point we were going to build a big hotel and casino in uh, Las Vegas. But unfortunately, 2008 kind of a, a messed up our planning, but we learned a lot of lessons from it. And we are back on our feet like major companies. And uh, we have continued building uh, different concept uh, and uh, different projects. Uh, to uh, fulfill the need of the market. Thank you. Thank you, Masood. Cool. And um, Adam, uh, now to you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about Academy Mortgage? Sure. So Academy Mortgage, the company I work for, is a 28-year-old company. We're a very large company. We have over 260 branches across the entire U.S. We've got over 2,500 employees, and we fund like a little bit over a billion dollars a month um, in loan fundings. We are privately owned, which means that we can kind of be nimble and flexible, which is pretty important in this environment. We do everything in-house, that's from processing, underwriting, appraisals, funding, servicing, and securitization. And we have our own relationships with all the major agencies, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Ginnie Mae, which as we go on with this discussion, you'll understand the importance of that. Um, myself, and my business partner, Jeffrey Brown, who works with me, we met probably around 2006, working for JP Morgan Chase. We were both doing a builder and condo business at the time. We had a huge pipeline of new construction condo developments in Miami that we were working on. And right about the same time that my student mentioned, 2008, a time I think everybody in this industry has kind of marked out, is when everything fell apart, right? And in like a span of a week, condo financing disappeared. Chase reneged on all, entire pipeline, millions of dollars of funding, they wouldn't fund anything. You had buildings with all these closing scheduled, nobody wants to fund the loans. And huge problem and despair kind of throughout the whole community. And that's kind of when Jeffrey and I teamed up because we wanted, we thought there was a way to fix mm -hmm. it, even though it seemed hopeless. And there were some new things that were coming out that everyone thought couldn't work, but we wanted to take a stab at it. And we put together a platform and the first building we tried it on was a building called the 1800 Club, uh, which you probably know. At the time it was 50% closed and nobody wanted to close. And we got that building FHA and Fannie Mae approved in tandem. It was the first time ever new construction high rise had gotten FHA approved. And what that allowed us to do was finance people with three and a half percent down. And these were people who were prepared to put 20% down, but you know, we're in the middle of a recession back then, nobody wanted to part with cash. So this gave them a feeling of being able to close at a good rate and keep their cash and be comfortable. And I think within a year we closed the entire building out and at good prices. So that kind of set the standard that we could do something with this platform. And that kind of started a 10 plus year journey 
that's led us to acting as preferred lender for countless, count, dozens and dozens and dozens of new construction projects here in Miami and throughout Florida, um, including 1030. And it's just, we've had the experience of, I mean, just thousands of transactions. We understand the buyers, we understand where they come from, what they're looking for, we understand how to finance these, we understand the psychology involved. So it's just the, just a, a business model that we had a lot of experience in. Okay, great, thank you. For the record, okay, 1030 is your best project. It's the most beautiful <laughs> project, and it yes. will be the most successful. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> All right, Mitzi, this next question is for you. So you have been in, in the real estate industry since 1985, as you mentioned, and you've obviously seen good and bad economies over the years. How do you see the current circumstances that we're in affecting the real estate market? Uh, it, every crisis has a different impact and has a different way to deal with. And uh, as much as I uh, try to avoid talking about 2008 crisis, I think it's going to just circling back and we have to talk about it. <laughs> so the difference was uh, when 2008 crisis happened, it took a few years uh, for everyone to recover. Mm -hmm. And basically, there was no financing. There was nothing, as everybody knows. I'm not going to repeat myself. This pan pandemic crisis is uh, kind of uh, changing the lifestyle and uh, how you work and how you uh, build and what you need to do for now and future. So nobody really doesn't know what the impact is going to be. Uh, I was talking to uh, some friends in uh, London and I asked the same question, what do you think your recovery time would be? They said they are calculating by two, 2025, right? So everybody has a different circumstances. And Miami is different than New York, for example. New York is gonna take a while and the lifestyle has to change. How much they're gonna change, they can't do a complete change. But Miami is different, it is really, uh, we are geared, we can do changes immediately, we can uh, use the high tech immediately to our buildings because they're not mega high rises and that they have the issue with the elevators in, in New York, the buildings. Here we have le less problem uh, uh, for that and the recovery time is a lot faster. And one of the reasons is a lot of people, as you know, they are moving from Northeast and they are experiencing all those problems to come to Miami. So as a secondary home, uh, which is exciting for us. And, and by having this crisis, so our thinking and approaching to the building construction has completely changed. Uh, for example, on the new buildings that we are designing right now, instead of having a, just a big space uh, for exercise and gym and uh, those purposes, we are dividing right now to four or five uh, sections. And uh, every section is going to be private for the different purposes. So you don't have mass of people over there. Even though you can control them, uh, by a different system, uh, Butterfly MX that we're going to be using in 1030. But still, if you start dividing this and seclude them a little bit, that's going to be a help. And other things that we like to do is more make the buildings more uh, private and more in case they want to it's kind of an interact, they can, but if they don't, exactly they can do it either to uh to so uh, what we are doing for example in 1030 is a boutique building and the, the boutique building is a way to go because you're going to have less people and also you have to create uh, open spaces which we did we created a lot of uh, large ter uh, terraces for the uh, units and uh the, we are we are doing a really high tech uh, uv light in the acs so the the impact mostly has been the way that you think and the way you're going to live and the, the way you're going to build. And that's, that was been a huge impact on that. Financially, there's not impact to our industries because people are still buying and they need housing. 
and they come. If there's been a hiccup a little bit and it's slowed down because the people are not traveling and they can't travel, but in the two weeks or three weeks, everything is going to open up. If it's not two weeks or three weeks, four weeks. So people are coming back. Either they are buying it right now in the virtual or we are getting our clients mostly in the Northeast. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, Adam, this next question is for you. So um, obviously, Mr. Uh, touched on a, a, a lot of very important things and undoubtedly, the world has been affected by this current pandemic and we are all cautiously trying to return back to normal, okay? But how has your business specifically been impacted by what's happening in these past three months? So that's a good question. And in order to really answer it, if I can, I'd like to go back a little bit to before COVID and just give a kind of understanding of how the mortgage industry works. Because I think once you know the mechanics behind it, you will see the changes that have happened recently in a different perspective. Um, and hopefully in the same way that I do. So the first thing to understand is that the mortgage industry in the US is very different from other parts of the world. Um, Lenders don't lend money and then wait for people to pay them back. Everything gets securitized. So I make a loan and then I sell that loan and it typically gets turned into a bond. So for the most part, everyone participating in the mortgage industry in the US, be it a bank, be it someone like Academy, be it a broker on the street, we're all basically originating mortgage bonds. That's kind of a good way to look at it. We're creating these mortgage bonds and then you and I and investors can go buy these bonds instead of treasury bills or something else and we get some kind of a yield on them. And that's how it works, right? So we, in order for me to operate, someone has to be willing to buy those bonds, right? And that's the basis of the industry. So what had happened is we have Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Jenny Mae. These are federal agencies that are in charge of securitizing, basically creating the bonds for conventional loans, FHA loans. And then there's a kind of world that exists on loans that they won't do, right? There's a lot of people they won't finance, uh, people who can't really show income, certain investors, foreigners, the whole group that don't fall into that bucket. And there's a world that built up around them and it's been accelerating recently up through COVID. Um, it's called the non-prime world. It's basically lenders who are willing to make loans to people that those agencies aren't. That world also driven by securitization. In that way, it's a little bit different because if I, you and I go buy a Fannie Mae back bond, there's an implicit government guarantee there that our principal is gonna be secure. So we would look at that kind of similar that we would look to a treasury bond. We're not very worried about our principal. We're just worried about what's our return going to be. On the non-prime world, there is no such guarantee. There's legitimate risk. People cannot pay those loans back. You cannot get your principal back. Um, but if you look at the last few years, what's been going on in the global economy, there's a desperate search for yield. Investors can't get safe investment yield. If you're in Europe and you put your money in the bank, you're paying money to have your savings account. That's a negative interest rate. You're not getting anything. You're giving money for someone to hold your money. And there's not a lot of bonds are trading at nothing. So there's not any good place where you could park your money and get some kind of decent return. And so that fueled this demand for these kind of non-prime products because you can get a higher rate, right? If you're an investor and you can't show income, you're not gonna get the same interest rate as a 30 year fixed conventional mortgage borrower. But that's okay because you still want financing and you're happy to take the higher rate if you can get it. And the investor is happy to get your higher yield in exchange for the risk because they have no place else to make money. And that had been accelerating and you'd see not loans were getting easier to get the last few years, right? Up until COVID, things were getting very easy. And that's because investors, had, there's always that FOMO right? And that's, that's how cycles always work. Everyone in the beginning is risk averse. And then eventually everyone starts to feel they're missing out. As other competitors get more competitive and aggressive, you can't seed that market share. So you have to increase your risk. And it's just the way the world works, right? We all kind of move towards that. Uh, we all move in that direction. And that's what had been happening, obviously, right? And we have lenders, some non-prime lenders were doing silly things at the point when we got to a peak. So, but everybody was buying it. That's the key thing. They were all being securitized and investors were all buying this stuff. So now what happens with COVID? So now we've kind of set the stage where we can really understand what happened piece by piece with COVID. So with COVID, the first thing that happened is a stock market crashed, right? First thing anybody really remembers. 
And what that did is that led to a deterioration of people's asset values, right? Stock values go down. A lot of things that are tied to stock goes down. So suddenly everybody's net worth is taking a big hit. And that's a problem because you have investors who are living on margin. So suddenly now your net worth is down. You need to make up that margin. So margin calls started coming in and coming in. And nobody had the cash to meet the margin calls. So you had to then start selling assets at a discount. At the same time, as you're getting margin calls, you're obviously not investing in new things, right? All your money needs to go to make the margin calls. So the demand for buying these securities, whew, vanished, completely vanished, even on the agency side, non-prime, absolutely. But even agency investors, people who traditionally bought those bonds didn't have the means to, they were too busy trying to make up margin calls. So in a very quick succession, the industry kind of fell apart, right? Because we're driven by the sale of those securities. And it got pretty scary. And what, the, what made things worse is that people who owned mortgage bonds in their portfolio now had to make margin calls. They need to sell those bonds, but nobody wants to buy them. So you can imagine the prices that they have to sell those bonds at. Now, the bigger problem is mark to market. That means that if you sell something that I own at a cheap price, I have to value it at that cheap price now. So as I'm holding mortgage bonds with nowhere to sell them to, and other people are getting desperate and selling them at a discount, I now am my value is getting lower and lower on paper, which means more margin calls for me and more and more. And you could see that quickly accelerates into a snowball. And that's what was it started to develop. This happened quickly, very, very quickly. So, the Fed did a couple things. They stepped in and they started to buy agency bonds. And they've been doing that since then. That immediately took the pressure off people originating Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Ginnie Mae loans for the most part, right? They then had an opportunity they could sell those bonds at a good price too. They're buying them at a good price, which has kept rates uh, on the lower side. But from the non-prime st standpoint, nobody's buying those. So a lot of those companies disappeared very quickly. They either had to shutter or they had to suspend operations because they just didn't have any way to finance originating more loans. They could make loans, but nobody wanted to buy them. And that happened, all this happened within maybe a few weeks of that first stock market crash. And these are kind of the mechanics that led to it. Um, on top of that, jumbo loans and HELOCs also started to peel apart for the same reasons. So the Fed comes in, they're buying mortgage bonds. They start to stabilize uh, conventional mortgage rates. And then we get hit with another win, forbearance. They come out and say, people don't have to pay their mortgages anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's a problem because if you're a loan servicer, you're someone who collects payments and pays the mortgage holders and you're, you're, all your borrowers go into forbearance, you still have to make the payments, even if you're not getting paid. And Go back to what we just talked about. Nobody's got cash. How are you supposed to suddenly start making all these payments for people when you're not getting any revenue? So immediately, nobody wanted to buy servicing anymore. That's a problem because mortgage rates are subsidized by servicing. When we sell the bond, we also sell the servicing. People pay dearly. They want to service those loans. And the money that you make by selling that servicing lowers the cost of borrowing. So that's where we started to see for a period of time very crazy rates up and down, up and down, up and down. And that's because servicing had disappeared and nobody really knew how to value those things. Fortunately, the Fed has listened. They've taken some action. Forbearance has a lot of the little issues in the implementation have been ironed out. Servicers are more comfortable again. And we have seen in general, a return to stability in the agency world. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Ginnie Mae, things are starting to get very stable again. Um, we're having no problem selling loans, rates are very low and rates are very stable. Non-prime is actually starting to see recovery as well. Even though they don't have any federal backstop, all the margin call things are gone. The stock market's back up to almost the highs it was at before. So a lot of those problems have disappeared and people are now starting to think about yield again. But of course, the, the concern is fear, right? Nobody knows exactly how this recovery is going to play out. So there's a balance. People need to make money. They need to get back into business. They're afraid of getting, you know, losing their shirt and making the wrong decisions. 
But that FOMO is already kind of to start up again. We're seeing non-prime lenders come back online. Every week we're seeing programs expand. And my guess is unless we see something radically different in what's been happening recently, that progress is going to continue. And we're going to see a recovery of the non-prime space as well. Jumbo loans are coming back this week. We had three more programs. So a lot of the instability that had occurred is already kind of being worked out. The only thing that's really challenging at the very moment is self-employed borrowers. And that's mainly because COVID has had such an impact on small businesses and the future impact is very much unknown. So there's a lot of onus on self-employed borrowers to prove that they're not impacted, that they're going to survive the next few months, next year. And it could be difficult to prove that. It'd be hard to demonstrate that. Um, my feeling is as things recover and more and more, it starts to look like a V-shaped recovery. Those guidelines will start to ease back. And we may be in by the end of the year, the same place we were at the beginning of the year from a financing standpoint. Um, and that's kind of a long winded version to explain what's been happening, but I feel compelled to do that because when I hear people talk about it, I hear very different opinions of what's going on and why these things were occurring. And if you don't understand the mechanics, you may think this is gonna go on forever. You may not understand why things would recover so quickly, but hopefully when you see what's been triggering it, it's, it's more regulatory issues that kind of drive these domino effect of margin calls and this and that but once those issues get resolved, the industry is not in such a bad place. Just like Masood said, I think in the real estate industry itself, I, I see rapid recovery, certainly down here in Miami. Um, you know, to me, this COVID is gonna accelerate a trend that had been occurring before, which is Miami looking like a much nicer place to live than places like New York, the Northeast, California, where you pay high state income tax, you're crowded in with people, and you don't have the same kind of weather and advantage that we have down here. So I'm very bullish. I'm bullish on the financing industry recovering soon and I'm bullish on the real estate industry. Excellent, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and that brings me now to um, Masood. Uh, you, you mentioned, Adam, that you know uh, Miami is becoming a better place to live, Masood, you as well, than say New York. And New York is gonna have a lot of correction to do. And reports certainly are showing that we are getting a large migration of Northerners, specifically New Yorkers, now relocating to Miami. I think that there were a lot of New Yorkers already kind of on the brink of, of wanting to move here for tax purposes alone. But now with this current pandemic, they are, they're, they've made that decision and they are fleeing New York City. And we're seeing a lot of them come here to a beautiful city in Miami and, and some of them are landing at 1030. So Masood, this question is for you. Um, when you launched 1030, where did you anticipate that the majority of your buyers would come from? Well, Every time that you launch a project, um, you have to consider all the factors. You, you can't just uh, build something and say, you're gonna target a specific uh, crowd, a specific location or a specific co uh, country. As you see, it just, uh, the world is not stable. You know, uh, two years, uh, one country is good, the other country goes down. They have a devaluation of their money. Uh, or the political changes. So you cannot just depend on one or two countries. You have to uh, think of uh, global, you know? Mm -hmm. So what you can do with your project that the global, anywhere in the, uh, in the world or in the country, they would love to come. Uh, you have to, you have to uh, just have something to uh, show. You have to have something that has value. You have to have something that has a design or uh, the location. So uh, originally, well, uh, we thought uh, basically we, uh, I divided in two parts. Uh, the uh, local people, it could be from Miami, it could be any from any part of the States or country, uh, US, or 50% would come from different countries. Could be from Europe, Canada, uh, Latin countries. Uh, basically, I would cover the whole entire world, all right? So, now, with the situation of this, uh, the pandemic and also the situation, some of the Latin countries, they have the restriction that they have, they cannot fly the, the evaluation and political issue. So we are getting most of our people right now from uh, Northeast and even local people. 
And the reason that we are getting so many people from there, of course, because of this situation that's happening, and but they're looking for mostly either single family or a large unit in kind of a boutique, uh, boutique uh, buildings, uh, not a high rise uh, per se. Uh, of course, they are sell selling, but not as much as used to be. But there's demand for single family and the boutique building is a lot more than used to be. And even in a uh, uh, building that we have, you know, people are interested to combine uh, two units together or three units together because they want to have a bigger space and they don't want to have a, that many neighbors, uh, which is great. And that works out. Uh, if you have a, a boutique uh, building that is uh, say 40 units and a few of them that they're combining two or three, that becomes supposed uh, 30 uh, uh, units in total. So that's very manageable and that's what they like. They don't want to go through what they're going through right now in Northeast in the buildings, suppose in New York or Boston and those areas. They want to have the flexibility. They can walk anytime they want. Uh, they, uh, they, they, they don't see their neighbors if they don't, uh, they don't need it. Uh, the uh, elevator is not being cr uh, crowded. So that's what we have, the influx of people uh, coming, coming here. And especially from Europe too, the Europe, the same thing. They, they, they want to come to Miami. They don't want to go somewhere else, again, because of either the taxes or because of the pollution or because of the uh, uh, crowded area. And here we have uh, basically all the restaurants are open, you know, based on the lower uh, capacity as they have their rules and regulation. But you can do your normal life and uh, not so much uh, restricted in a way that you have to stay home all the time. Uh, you can go to your work, you can do walking. The, uh, our project is uh, especially is located to uh, Lincoln Road, as you know. Uh, the uh, the, uh, the uh, Amazon uh, is going to open up the four star uh, store, which is very exciting. So people like that. People want to come and see it. People want to come and walk. And uh, that's our focus uh, based, basically on that. We want to just a boutique, boutique projects everywhere that we go. Thank you, Mr. Yuth. Yeah, certainly Miami is an international market attracting people from all over the world and 1030 could not be better positioned right now to meet that growing demand for boutique living. Absolutely. Um, Adam, this next question is for you. So uh, there seems to be a good number of people that I, I talk to on a daily basis that feel that now is not the right time to buy because they foresee some incredible opportunities on the horizon. Uh, if they just waited out a little bit. What are your feelings on this? I'm going to probably offend a lot of people here because I have a completely different viewpoint. Um, I think right now is the probably the best time in recent history to purchase. Right now, this moment. Um, I think that rates are low and they're gonna stay low for a little while. Uh, I think that going forward, as the economy recovers, rates are going to increase. So that's going to make it more expensive in the future to buy, and meaning today is going to be less expensive than in the future. Also, if you look, there's, there was a problem that existed before this, uh, an inventory problem throughout the country. And sure. that had been leading to prices going up and up, because if you have more demand than supply, that's what happened. And this crisis is not making that any better. It's making it worse, right? The first thing that happened is tons of people took their homes off the market because mm -hmm. they didn't want people walking through them. So we had an inventory crisis that got even worse. So for me, as someone who values logic, it's hard to make that connection from even less inventory to suddenly better prices because that's not how market forces work, right? If you have the same demand and you have less to buy, you have bidding wars. And that is what we're seeing. We're seeing it every day in Miami. And I think that's going to continue. I think that what people are thinking about when they think there's a big opportunity is I think like Masood had mentioned, people get confused and I think they're miscorrelating this pandemic with the 2008 crash, but it really couldn't be more different. Nothing about it is the same literally nothing other than the stock markets crash. That's the only similarity. The motivating reasons are completely different. Back then, everyone owned homes that they shouldn't have owned. They had no equity in them and they didn't qualify for them. So when things got tough, 
it was very easy for them to give up those homes. And at the same point, the prices had been incredibly inflated because of that, because we manufactured a bunch of buyers out of thin air. We inflated the demand to a proportion that shouldn't have existed. That hasn't been the case at all recently, right? We have good demand, but we have almost no supply. That's what's been driving prices up. That's legitimate price drive. That's not inflation. And that's not easy to reverse. The other thing is most people have been buying for cash or very heavy down payments. Tons of people now have a lot of equity. So people aren't going to be so quick to walk away from equity. That's their life savings. And I would say, why would they walk away? If I'm someone and I'm having trouble right now, there's so many resources for me to get help, right? The government will let me, if I have a government loan, I can go into forbearance almost in perpetuity right? I don't have to make the payment. So why would I sell you my house at a discount when I'm basically living here rent free? I wouldn't, right? There'd be no pressure for me to do that. And even people who don't have the ability to get forbearance, right? You can have a mortgage that's not government backed. You may have the ability to get government backed help in a PPP loan, which tons of people are doing. So there's a lot of resources to get access to much needed cash from the government to help you steer through this so that you don't have to sell your house at a super big discount. And there's got going to be very many people that are going to be compelled to do that. Now, where you might see opportunity is investors who got a little over exuberant, people who went on Airbnb runs and bought 15 properties and invested them with high interest rate financing, and now they can't fill them. Some of that's going to happen, but it's not a big percentage of the market. And there are so, so many people waiting to take advantage of that. Hedge funds, giant companies, P the average investor basically has no chance. You're not gonna ever, by the time you even hear about it, these things are done. So I don't see this enormous opportunity coming at all. What I see is steady price appreciation and eventually rates moving up. So to me, if I'm gonna buy now or later, now is much better than later. I would rather be on the other end of that price appreciation and having seen the property I bought today be 10% more next year than having to pay 10% more for it. And that's my feeling. Thank you. That's actually uh, very informative. Uh, okay, let's do this next question is for you. Um, what was your thought process in getting 1030 Fannie Mae approved and was this a difficult undertaking? As I previously mentioned, uh, the, the, the way that I uh, wanted to market this uh, project uh, to cover up all the markets uh, in uh, the places. Uh, and uh, what I said, 50% of uh, my thought was basically cover the local people. Uh, so that's kind of a gives me idea, not everyone well, are willing to put 30% down payment. Uh, not everyone is willing to uh, uh, put 20%, all right? So uh, if you are local, uh, so that's what we talked to Adam, and uh, we come over and said, okay, what's the best we can do? What's the minimum down payment that we can have? So that's what we started with 15% for local people deposit. And then if that particular client that has, is placing 50% deposit, and purchase the unit, and they can be qualified for bigger uh, mortgage, then that the deposit is gonna be, the down payment is gonna be even less. So they get the credit at the time of closing, so maybe they only come up with a 5% uh, or 7% or 8% or 3%, depends on all the financial the situation of uh, uh, individual. So that was very attractive, it was very important. If, 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 if I wanna cover the local market, I must have that, all right? If I'm just looking for the foreigners and that doesn't work, so they have to come up with a 30% deposit anyway. So there wouldn't have been any need uh, to have uh, uh, kind of a, a program that Adam is offering uh, for us. But uh, local people right now are key and is uh, the uh, buying uh, a lot, which is great. And that's what we have to have that tool. And I'm glad that uh, we worked on something with Adam. Adam is uh, having a, uh, unbelievable programs for the uh, buyers and uh, it's working great. Okay. 
Thank you. Now, um, I've been doing this for um, a long time, and I started in an era where uh, people could buy uh, pre-construction, sign a contract, total 10% deposit, assignability, all kinds of things. People were making money on, 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 on the properties before they were even built. Reselling, reassigning. Uh -huh. And after 2008, obviously, that changed uh, the deposit structure for pre-construction projects dramatically. And a lot of pre-construction required 50% down, sometimes more. Which, sometimes 100 uh, in the beginning. <laughs> absolutely. And, and that certainly um, took, I think, a lot of American buyers out of the equation in pre-construction and put a big focus on international buyers. You've been doing this a long time, Adam. Um, in your experience, how, how common is this to see 15% deposits not, for Not a buyers common at all. Yeah, it's, it, it's not at all common. And especially on new construction condominiums. Um, the reason is, as Masood said, he went through the effort to get the Fannie Mae approval. A lot of buildings don't do that. If you don't do that, then you don't really have a good financing alternative for your buyers. You don't have any way to really give them low down payment financing. And so in that case, giving them a low deposit structure doesn't make a lot of sense because they still are going to need 50% to even close. They don't have another means to do it or however it is. They're going to need 100% to close if they can't get any financing. So I think that it's a combination of things. I think local buyers for sure don't have that. And as you said, countless projects that have closed recently, local buyers are the minority. They just don't have that cash to participate. Even though they may be able to qualify for the loans without a Fannie Mae PERS approval, they couldn't even get the loans there. So they were largely held out of that. Um, in this case, a boutique building I've always felt. One thing Masood said on that I just want to touch on is he mentioned that design is important now. And I've, I've always kind of felt that when times are great and people are indiscriminately buying, mm -hmm. like in your case, flipping contracts, right? If you're going to flip a contract, you don't really care about the property, right? It, it's not, there's no emotional attachment, but we're selling now to end users. We're selling to people who want to live in the homes. And so they really kind of have to want the home, which means it has to appeal to them. It has to be unique. It has to give them something that gets them emotionally engaged. It can't just be a big square in the top in the giant building that looks like every other building. So I think what 1030 has in that it's something that everyone can connect with on an emotional level. It's someplace that you want to live. It's someplace where you have financing options for local buyers that works for them. You know, three, five, six percent down payments. That's the kind of cash people have saved up for this kind of stuff. And to have offer low deposits, which nobody else offers, really kind of makes it one of the only games in town, I think. And certainly if you're looking to shop anywhere else in the news market or, or something else with resale homes, you just can't compete. You can't, you can't compete with the, the value for the dollar and for the ability to finance. Well, Anna, let me yeah. add, you, add something here. Uh, that's what you, you see in uh, uh, most of the builders are not offering Fannie Mae and uh, because they're requiring 50% uh, deposit because they're only concentrating on the uh, Latin countries or other uh, Europe or anywhere else. And in order to do get the Fannie Mae and the way that I'm doing, it requires you to uh, put a lot of money, all right? So you're not using basically the deposit as part of your construction, all right? So you are basically advancing money. That's why a lot of builders are not willing to do that. But as we have a majority of our buyers now becoming local, so we you gotta do this. And that's require a lot of cash. Then you have to advance the commission from your own pocket. So that's why I've been willing to do that because the project is amazing and that uh, attracts a lot of local and that's what we're doing. And a, okay, a lot of people you. aren't in the position to do that even if they wanted to. Correct, this that's true. exactly right. This is true. Um, and that being said, I also want to add that um, while we offer an amazing deposit structure for the local buyers of only 15%, 1030 also offers an amazing deposit structure for international buyers of 30%. So, Which I would think um, is even more important now with currency situations and restrictions. Exactly. exactly. Now, it's, uh, it's definitely a win-win there. Um, and Adam, this next question is for you as well. I know we've been talking a lot about Fannie Mae. Uh, and, and Ginny May and, and all these wonderful uh, mortgage and finance terms that for some of us is absolute, a language we don't speak. 
Okay. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what Fannie Mae is um, specifically and what it means for us here at 1030? Yeah, absolutely. So Fannie Mae and a, has a sister agency, Freddie Mac. You can consider them the same for most purposes. They are the bedrock of the conventional mortgage industry in the U.S. They are the buyer of all the loans that we originate, right? They're the, the engine that makes the industry operate. And as uh, Masood mentioned, what happens is uh, Florida has a very unique guideline for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac loans, where if you are a new construction condominium, you can't get a loan from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac unless your building has this PERS approval. So all the other buildings that are new, that are just COing now that don't have it, you can't get any kind of conventional finance. Whereas at 1030, we'll have unending supply of it. Why that's important, and it's more important now than ever, and COVID should really demonstrate to everyone how critical this is. Because as I went through my story, you saw within a week, all the other financing disappeared, gone. And what came back first and what held the longest, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And that's only because they are under government conservatorship and they're quasi-government entities. So when things, we're in an uncertain environment, right? And we probably will be for who knows, many years. One thing you can count on is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac because you can count on the US government, right? That's the option of last resort. So that's why it's really important now because it's a lot of things compounding on the buyer, right? There's uncertainty in the future. There's uncertainty on where their, whether their investments are gonna go, how much cash they're gonna need. There's liquidity concerns. And so anything you can do to alleviate those concerns helps a buyer make that purchase decision. And I think that being able to offer them reliable financing that you can guarantee is going to be there regardless of what transpires in the world and at very low rates and very low down payments is a nice safety blanket because it's something you can, you can look at, it's tangible, you can rely on it. And I think COVID shown that some of the other financing, while it's, they're great tools, they're not as reliable. You can't expect them to always be there. Fannie Mae financing will always be there and it's an unending source of liquidity. And it also, as these other programs come online, Jumbo starts to come back and other non-prime loans start to come back, they're going to look to the Fannie Mae approval as a stamp of approval, meaning that they're going to differentiate where they're going to lend in new construction buildings based on who has it and who doesn't. Because when you're selling these loans into a kind of scared investor market, that really helps. Having this gold stamp from a government agency makes that seem a lot more credible. And it's a lot easier to sell that into the investment community than one where nobody knows what's going on with these buildings. And so obviously we've been doing this for 10 years, Fannie Mae approvals. We've believed in it for a long time. For a local buyer, there's nothing, nothing comes close to it. But in today's world, I'd say it's more important than it has ever been. And I think that the recent events has kind of demonstrated that. How difficult is it to get a Fannie Mae loan versus a conventional loan? Conventional loan is a Fannie Mae loan. So the conventional loan refers to a loan that follows Fannie Mae's or Freddie Mac's guideline. That's the conventional mm -hmm. mortgage industry. So um, they're both the same ease to get right there. Some of the most liberal guidelines that are available. I see. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I have one final question for Adam, and then we're going to turn to uh, the audience and see uh, what questions they have. So, um, with so much uncertainty in today's market, um, what advice can you give to anyone who's looking to finance a home? That's a good question. I'll tell you what I think the most important thing right now is to have an expert you can rely on. Um, the world we live in today is one of the big plagues of this kind of information world we live in is that it's very hard and every day it gets harder to determine what information is accurate and what isn't. What's real, what's not real, what's intentionally misleading, what's factual. And that problem just is gonna get compounded. 
And so in uncertain times, you really need to have someone that you can trust who's credible, who can deliver accurate information for you. So I would say more than ever, you want to be speaking to a human being who knows what they're doing. Um, the other thing is guidelines are changing rapidly, right? Self-employment guidelines, especially it's tough for self-employed borrowers now. So if you've been pre-approved and even if you work with someone who you trust, if they haven't looked at your situation recently, you probably want them to look at it again because guidelines may have changed and your situation may have changed. So essentially what I would say is you want to have someone you trust that you can work with and then be in regular contact with them. Let them do their job for you. Let them make sure you remain approved. Let them make sure that you're staying on the right side of the guidelines. Let them stay up to date on your financial situation so that you don't reveal something later that ends up being a surprise and hurts your chances. Financing is back, rates are low, but you just have to be smart about being prepared early. That's, I would say, is the main thing I would say. If you can get in touch with someone in the beginning, get pre-approved, go through that underwriting process up front, the world is your oyster. And you have very little to worry about. But if you don't, you're exposing yourself to all kinds of uncertainties that can come back to harm, which really isn't necessary. You don't have to do that. You don't have to go through that path. You can get a lot of certainty up front you just need to be in trusted hands. I couldn't agree with you more on that. Thank you so much, Adam. Okay, so now I'd like to turn to uh, the audience and see if we have any questions. Um, we don't have audio available, so the questions need to come in through chat. I will read them off and we can get answers. Also, I would like to add that everyone who has registered today will be receiving uh, a follow-up email with my contact information and Adam's contact information at Academy Mortgage. So if you wish to reach out to Adam directly on anything relating uh, to financing, you will have all of his contact by the end of the day today. Um, hello, Maria Leno. What is the starting price range uh, and when are you expecting to be closing? Um, Masood, would you like to answer that or would you like me? The starting pricing is $498,000 and uh, our expectation for closing would be the uh, first quarter of next year. Thank you. Are there any more questions from the audience with respect to financing or 1030? Uh, question for Adam. What are you hearing from the retail banks and their ability and reliability to execute loans? So that's a good question. So here's the thing to understand about retail banks. So a retail bank is in many, many, many businesses at the same time, right? They may do mortgages, but they do checking accounts, investment accounts, all kinds of businesses. Um, the mortgage business most often than not represents a tiny fraction of their overall revenue, but it represents a very large amount of their risk that they take. So in general, larger banks from a business perspective are not benefited from making mortgages. Um, they are kind of compelled to be in that business because of the other businesses that they provide. Um, and because of their kind of stature in the United States, you, you, they just kind of have to do it. But they do it on their own terms. As you know, if you've ever worked with a bank, they do the loans that they wanna do. Um, they're not necessarily looking to accommodate every customer, they're looking to do business that is safe for them. And so when things get um, uncertain, like we are now, they're the first ones to pull back. And you've seen that. We've seen the major banks pull back severely, uh, impose overlays on conventional guidelines. So I should say something here. Conventional guidelines are publicly available, right? You can go, anyone can go look them up. You can read all about them. You can see them. You can underwrite yourself if you wanted to. The, the, the difference is that if I make a loan to those guidelines, I can sell that to the agencies, no problem. But I can also make a loan that's harder to get than those guidelines allow. And I can sell that loan too. I can make it more difficult. And a lot of banks do that. What they essentially do is cut out portions of the borrowing demographic that they don't want to serve because they think they're too risky. And they impose overlays that basically filter those people out. So we don't do that, but that happens. And that kind of leads this understanding that, well, what are your guidelines versus other people's, which is kind of a misnomer because they're all the same guidelines really. It's just that some banks don't choose to impose the bare ones. They want to make it more difficult. And that's what's been happening recently. And that'll continue to happen. Um, if you're really looking for a, a mortgage in a purchase environment, a bank is probably not your best choice. 
they're not in it with you. They're not in it with you. They're not in there to make sure this thing closes for you. They're in it for their business side of it, which is whether or not they feel comfortable enough to do it. And a lot of times you won't know if they're comfortable until it's too late for you. And they're not really looking at your contract or your deposit or anything to safeguard it. So just not the best fit for people who need financing and are putting money on the on the line for it, like everyone who's buying something. Thank you. Okay, another question for Adam. This is from a realtor. What programs do you have for foreign buyers? So we have a, a kind of a suite of foreign programs. And I'll say one thing about foreign national financing. So historically, foreign national financing had been done primarily from banks, local banks who are in the market, who deal with a lot of overseas buyers, understand the buyer, understand the market. Um, and local banks here, right? For, the mo for years, the bulk of the foreign national financing was all local banks. Um, that's changed recently. It's changed, A, a lot of those local banks are gone. They've been consolidated, they've been bought up by other banks and they've just disappeared with their programs too. What replaced them was this non-crime world, right? Which is securitized, it's different. When the bank lends to a foreigner, they just have to know their business themselves. They don't have to meet any investor's demand or try to convince an uh, investor why this is a loan worth doing or not worth doing. Um, but a non-prime lender does. So while there were, those programs are out there, they were a little bit trickier. There's a program that we've had. It's an alignment we have with a bank that's been doing loans down here for foreign nationals for 35 years, 40 years. They are not going anywhere. They've been doing it forever. Um, they'll lend 70%, very low rates, very easy qualifications, and more importantly, utter reliability. So that's our main program. That's been our bedrock. We have other non-prime programs we use. Sometimes they make sense. Sometimes they don't. Um, we always vet them to make sure they're going to work beforehand, but it's important to have kind of a, a suite of things to choose from, but you definitely need that one thing that's not going anywhere. Just like we have Fannie Mae for conventional, we kind of have our foreign national bedrock too. That's stable. It's not going to ever leave. Thank you. Um, this question is from Luis uh, from Matsud. Good morning. Uh, what is the percentage down payment for international buyers? Matsud? That, that question for me? Yeah. Or, <laughs> yeah. What, what is yeah, the down well, payment? What is the down payment required uh, for international buyers? International oh, down payment or deposit? Uh, thirty percent. Uh, the deposit is thirty percent. Yeah. Um, or maybe not. Maybe we're asking about what is the percentage payment for? Okay, Luis, please clarify your question. Are we talking about for the loan, or are we talking about for the contract at ten thirty? The truth uh, is, is that in turn... most cases, it's, it's going to be pretty much the same. It's going to be pretty similar. Okay. Uh, question for Adam. Um, other than self-employed borrowers who seem to have a tougher time getting loans today, what major changes or restrictions have there been for regular salaried borrowers that may have impacted good borrowers from getting loans? So the only, there, there really hasn't been. What it is... And it makes sense when you think about it is if you were a salaried employee and you've been furloughed or you've had your hours reduced or you've had to take a temporary pay cut or your job isn't open and you haven't been able to go to work, those people right now are impacted, right? You're impacted where if you've taken a pay cut and you try to get a loan, you're going to have to qualify at your reduced pay for the moment until your new pay comes back. If you're, if your income has been interrupted for because the business isn't open or you're on your furloughed for a few weeks, you're not going to be able to get a loan during that time because you're not going to have income to qualify. But these aren't necessarily, these aren't guideline changes. These are just situation changes. People's situations are being changed by COVID. Um, anyone who's working your job like you were before, if your business is unimpacted, if your salary hasn't changed, if your hours haven't been reduced, there's everything is the same. Your ability to get a loan is essentially the same. Um, the only thing I would say is credit has become a bit more important um, in terms of 
loan approvals that were easier to get with lower credit scores are a little bit harder. So you want to make sure you have your credit in place. It doesn't mean you need an 800 credit score, but 700, 720, 740 usually is good enough. And fortunately, credit is something that most people don't realize can usually be easily optimized. Um, we take people's credit and increase it 50 to 100 points on a routine basis. And it's not magic. It's because people's scores are unfairly low. The, the low scores are not really representative of how they've behaved. They just don't, they've been on the wrong side of the, un, of the automated engines that create these scores. And what we can do is just kind of figure out, okay, well, how do we fix that for you? How do we get your information so it better represents who you've been? And when you can do that, people's scores go up pretty easily. So in general, if you have the same job and things are going well, this is the time to buy. You're the lucky one. You're a buyer in a market where rates are low and prices are only going up and you can go take advantage of that and you should be. Okay, so this next question, I, I would like to um, answer part of it myself and then uh, the rest is for Adam. Um, from a realtor, uh, 1030 is definitely a gorgeous building, but is it really a unique building? Um, how are you going to comp 1030 for appraisal? So I'd like to start off the answer on this. I believe, and I've, I've been doing this for a good 20 years, um, that 1030 is in fact a very unique building for where it is. If you were to take it and put it somewhere else, perhaps it wouldn't be unique. But in the heart of South Beach where we're building, there is no other building that offers 10 foot ceilings, that offers a completely smart building, that offers a 24 hour lobby attendant, or even a pool. And not only do we have a pool, but we have this gorgeous pink pool behind me. Um, so in my opinion, it is in fact a unique building for the area. But that being said, Adam, how are you going to come 1030 for appraisals? So I think you've kind of already kind of given away a little bit of the secret, which is that the first thing to really understand when you're appraising it is that it is unique for the area, but it's not unique in general. We can find comparable buildings in other areas. And so, and we've done, we've worked on projects that are, nothing as beautiful as 1030 before, but things that were unique, had circumstances that were kind of unusual for the area. Um, and the way that we get around that is basically, you have to give up a little bit of the proximity factor. So you can't just look for things that are right next door. You just have to give up on that. And you have to make adjustments for geography, but instead find things that are really cl more closely aligned to the actual product. And like you said, you, we can find that. We may have to step outside of the middle of South Beach, but we can find things that are comparable. And then you just make the adjustments for the area. And that's just really the way to do it. You have to find, you gotta determine what, is, what makes the property unique that I would wanna match it with something. Like how do, what makes something similar to this? And I would argue it's not the location in this case. The location doesn't make something similar to 1030 it's the individual and unique aspects of the project that make it something similar. So we would look to find things that are similar in that respect, and then we would make adjustments for the geography. And that's basically how you handle these cases. Especially on building it. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> uh, a, a question for uh, Masu. Show me your design work is incredible. Is that something that your team handles in-house or do you work with design firms? Uh, well, thank you so much for the compliment. Uh, we, um, I basically design everything uh, starts in uh, my head and I, I want to vision something and uh, I draw it on a paper and I write down the elements that I want to see in that building. Either uh, that it depends on the type of the project it is and how complex it's going to be. Uh, either we use it, we do it in-house or we have the outside architect that we work with or outside the third party that we work with. Uh, we have an in-house uh, uh, designer we have, we use uh, from outside too. So basically it depends on the size of the project and complexity that if we can do it in-house or not. But the original design, regardless who's gonna do it for us, it comes from me. Okay. Um, a question for me, um, when is the building really likely to deliver? Well, we are really likely to deliver when we say we're going to deliver, which is April of 2021. Granted that there is no force majeure that would delay our construction. But right now we have been very fortunate uh, through this whole pandemic. We have not been delayed with, uh, with any of our construction. And so we are, we are slated for that April timeframe. That's correct. Uh, the next question, um, Adam, 
What are the basic requirements for 15% loan local buyer? Thanks. So same as a 20% loan. The, the down payment difference doesn't make any difference. If you, from an occupancy, occupancy perspective, to get a 15% down loan, you need to either be, actually, you can be any occupancy, primary investor. So truthfully, in that case, if you want to put 15% down, it's the same, just like getting any regular loan. You just have to qualify for the payment. That's it. It's a higher payment, right? You're not borrowing, you're not putting 20% down, so you're borrowing a little bit more. But as long as you can qualify for the payment, anyone is eligible for that. Thank you. Okay, we are, we need to wrap it up. We're already at 1130. But uh, another quick question here, and this is something that I actually come across a lot. And, uh, and, and again, you know, I, I, I've been selling for a long time, but I don't specialize in mortgages. So for me, it's still um, a bit confusing as well. Uh, the question here is how many units did you already approve for FHA in 1030? And I know that a lot of people confuse Fannie Mae for FHA. Um, so can you please answer Yelena's yeah. question and then explain the sure. difference? Sure. So first thing to understand is FHA financing is completely different from Fannie Mae. They have their own agency, Ginny Mae, right? So that's how different they are. Um, the, they also, on a new construction project, it's the same idea. In order to get any kind of FHA loans, they have to go through a different process. Just like we went through the Fannie Mae process, you'd have to go through FHA's individual process. Now, the thing is, is that it doesn't make a lot of sense to do that at a building like 1030, or for that matter, most buildings that are new construction in this area. The reason is because FHA loans have a loan limit, and they will only go so high. And that loan limit, I think, recently is 345. It's way below the price points here. And the main benefit of FHA is typically low down payment financing. So you don't really get that benefit if you have to come up with an extra $150,000 just to get to your purchase price. So FHA isn't really a good fit for pretty much any property where the prices are above 375 or higher. Um, the, the other thing is about FHA is that the main benefit that people typically associate with it is a low down payment. So, but let's talk about that because it's a three and a half percent down payment. That's the minimum. It's only available to primary residents. You cannot get an FHA loan if you're a second home buyer or an investor. Now, Fannie Mae loans, you can have with a 3% down payment, even less than FHA if you're a primary resident. But if you're a second home buyer, you can get a conventional loan with 10% down. You can't get any FHA loan if you're a second home buyer. If you're an investor, you can get a conventional loan with 15% down. So not only does it kind of outdo FHA at its own game when it comes to primary residences, but it offers so much more, so much more for other buyers and for other programs that Fannie Mae approval means something for other things. So, and I, I kind of started this off on the wrong foot when I first, when you asked me the first question, because I talked about the building we got FHA approved back in 2008. I should point out at the time, FHA loan limits had been enhanced temporarily and they were the same level as Fannie Mae loans. And Fannie Mae wasn't allowing 3% down payments. So at that time, it made a lot of sense and FHA, FHA solved problems. Today, Fannie Mae solves most of the problems on its own. And unless you're dealing with really kind of lower price pointed properties, the FHA loan isn't that relevant. Okay, yeah, um, Fannie Mae is definitely a very competitive product. And Yelena, to answer your question, there have been no loans yet approved for 1030 because we have not closed on any of the units. That will start happening in April. Um, okay, so, uh, oh, again, another question from Yelena. So how many, okay, I think this is the same question. How many with Fannie Mae low down payment? Um, none thus far, uh, because we have not closed on, on the development. Uh, no, I should, I should say something there though. Um, sure. And you're, you're absolutely right, right? Uh, we can't close the loans until the building is done, obviously. But we are approving loans in, in terms of we're underwriting the buyers, right? So I don't want people to think that it's just kind of a guessing game whether they're going to get the loan at the end of the day because it's not that at all. When we look at a buyer and they're going to make an offer on the property, we're underwriting them completely just and using the same, same philosophies that I kind of described of what people should look for, right? We're, we're underwriting them today. We're staying engaged, making sure they stay approved and kind of doing everything we can to be certain that that financing is going to be there for that particular person. 
when the closing comes. Um, the, the Fannie Mae approval will take care of itself. Once the building is CO'd, that's kind of a formality that will just happen and we'll be able to go over the loans. But people are still getting approved in terms of their credentials today. Obviously, right? Everyone's getting approved. They know that they can get the loan. Thank you. Uh, there's one more question here. Sorry, you answered. Thank you. Okay. Um, actually, I had a question here in the Q&A. Uh, question for Adam. I have clients that want to make sure now that they qualify for a loan later. Can you help with that? I just want to make sure that they give a down payment. Uh, when will they be able to close? Oh, that they will be able to close if they give a down payment. And I think, I think that's, I think that. that's, yeah, I think that's what I just said. Mm -hmm. okay. The answer is yes. For, Ad <laughs> for Adam, far too many mortgage brokers issue bogus pre-approvals. I've seen those. <laughs> what makes you different from others? I just want to make certain my clients can come through when it's time. So it's actually something that is a sticking point for me because the way I view this business is I'm here to help the client, right? The client wants something that's very dear to them, right? They're not buying a Starbucks coffee. They're buying someplace they're gonna live in. It's gonna be part of their life for years. Or if they're not gonna live in it, it's gonna be a huge transaction, a uh, big financial decision. And personally, I feel an incredible indebtedness to that because this means something serious for the person and I feel accountable to making sure that I support that as much as I can. And so regardless of the business, I would always kind of have the same philosophy, which is when people come to me and they want to get a loan, I want to be sure they're getting a loan, right? Even more than them, for me to sleep at night, I want to be sure that I'm not putting them in a position where they're going to put money at risk and then be disappointed, right? Lose money, lose a deposit, or just be, have like, be heartbroken. I'm not looking to break people's hearts. I'm looking to help people. So, and the only way to do that realistically is you have to underwrite them up front. There's just no shortcut to it. I can't just ask you, what do you make and tell me your credit and give you a letter. It doesn't mean anything, right? My dog's been pre-approved four times, but she doesn't qualify. She doesn't even work. She just sleeps all day. So it doesn't make sense. So you have to do the work up front. You have to make sure they qualify. You have to ask the right questions, right? You got to be you can't be afraid. Too many mortgage brokers are afraid to ask questions. They just want to say what you want to hear, whether it's true or not. But that doesn't help you when you really need something at the end of the day. So you have to be willing to ask the questions that could kind of unnerve, unseat problems. Because the truth is that a lot of problems can be fixed, but they have to be fixed up front. And so if we can isolate the issues, many times we can get past them. But if we never get to the issues until the end of the day, there's usually no way to fix them then. And that's where bogus pre-approvals turn into bad deals. Um, and it's just kind of, it's a philosophical difference. It's about how you run your business, right? A lot of businesses just look to churn. They just look to take as many applications you make. And there's a lot of ways to make money in this business. But for me, there's only a few ways to do it well, where you're really serving the people you're supposed to serve. And that means delivering pre-approvals that are always 100% accurate. And that's what we've done. We've never delivered a pre-approval thousands of transactions, thousands of pre-approvals, they've all got the loan. But because it's not rockets, it's not brain surgery, right? It, you just, if you know how to do the job, you just do it in the beginning. That's it. You just do it up front. We always pick up the right company for any purposes. Absolutely. And, and we certainly vulnerable. appreciate that. Yes. And we appreciate that here at 1030, for sure. Um, okay, that sums up uh, the list of questions. Actually, there is one more question coming in from uh, Patricia. She'd like to know how many units have been reserved so far. So Patricia, I'd like to just clarify, um, we are not in reservation stage. We are in contract stage, uh, phase, contract phase. And uh, we currently have um, 11 units under contract and um, uh, another two that we are negotiating. So we hope to have 13 uh, fairly soon which puts us, I believe, at around the 30% mark for the building, 30% uh, under contract. So if you have any clients, bring them quickly. We are gonna sell out quickly. Um, okay, so that uh, uh, sums it up for today. So in closing, I'd like to say thank you, Sue. Thank you, Adam, for your time. I know I thank found- uh, Happy to be here. I've, 
Thank you. And I know I found today's webinar to be incredibly informative. I hope that everybody who tuned in today also um, found today to be uh, informative. If you'd like to know more about the project, uh, you will be receiving an email with, um, as I mentioned earlier, my contact information and Adam's contact information uh, before the end of the day. So feel free to reach out. Um, we're here to assist with um, any concerns, any questions, any buyers uh, that, uh, that you want to throw at us. So thank you again. Um, thank you and have a great day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.